God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. This morning, as we begin the last week of the Lambeth Conference, we complete our tour of the Anglican Communion by joining the American Church and using their liturgy for the communion today. I'd like to welcome everyone who's here and for all of those joining us thanks to the power of technology. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. as an inheritance. 
and he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith, without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. For the word of the Lord. Amen. Blessed are those slaves 
in the basket finds a nut that he comes. Truly I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May my words be spoken and may they be heard in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace of God. In today's Gospel, Jesus said, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, in a few days, all being well, Sue and I will be setting off on another long and complicated journey, train journey to visit friends and family in France, so we're thinking about what to pack in our suitcases and keep them as light as possible. I wonder what sort of packer you are. Do you meticulously plan your wardrobe for every day of your holiday, taking account of all conceivable variations in weather, or do you just chuck as much as possible into your cases and hope for the best? You probably won't be taking your most prized possessions, your favorite wedding photo, say, or your expensive food processor. You might be even take it of someone who always takes with them an electric mini pancake maker on holiday. I wouldn't do that, but there we go. <laughs> um, you, you won't take uh, your favorite house plant. You won't take the carriage clock given to your grandfather George on his retirement in 1934. You won't take them because Although they're very important to you, you obviously don't need them on holiday, you can be reasonably confident that they'll still be at home when you get back, and they'll be safer there anyway. Many people in today's world, sadly, have to pack a suitcase, often in only a few minutes, and leave home not knowing when or if they will ever return, or if they do return, whether their home will still be there when they get back. Were I faced with that ghastly situation, I suspect my attitude to my prized possessions would be rather different. The awful truth is I would have to leave them all behind, or all but the very the smallest of them. There are things I would feel a little sense of bereavement over if I had to leave them behind forever. But I hope that before long I would be able to let go of them and realize that at the end of the day, they are just things that are far less important to me than my own survival. I'm sure many a migrant will testify to that experience. Abraham was a migrant. The book of Genesis tells us that his family came from Ur in present-day Iraq, a city ancient even in Abraham's time. And at some point we aren't told why. His father Terah took him and the rest of his family hundreds of miles north to Haran, which was probably on the present-day border between Turkey and Syria. And then we're told he was called by God to leave the settled security of city life and head south into the wilderness of Canaan <coughs> as a nomadic herdsman with all the uncertainties that would involve scrapping the water and pasture with the indigenous peoples there. And as the letter to the Hebrew says, not knowing where he was going, he must have left behind much that he valued and enjoyed. And at that point, too, he didn't even have a son and heir to take responsibility for his camels, sheep, and goats when he became too old to look after them himself. Yet he obeyed God's call and he went. 
the message of this passage from Hebrews that we had this morning for our first reading is that we're all like Abraham on a journey, a journey through life, strangers and foreigners, as Hebrews says, because we're not yet in our homeland, the homeland God has promised us. We don't know how long that journey will be or where it may take us, even if we never move from South London or North Surrey. It's not simply a journey along a timeline. It's also, firstly, an inward journey, a journey inside ourselves into the core of our being, to the divine spark which God has planted within us, which is what we mean when we say we are made in his image. It involves digging down through all the sins, the weaknesses, the character defects, traumas and failings which did that spark and which separate us from the treasure in heaven. And there we find that in spite of them all, we are truly forgiven, accepted and loved for who we are as God made us. And if that journey, that excavation does difficult, the good news is that Jesus has done the digging for us and carried all the bad stuff away with him to the cross. We've only got to follow him, as it were, down the hole and find there the peace of God which passes all understanding. And so be at peace with ourselves, even though we ne never truly arrive, but be constantly led onwards by Jesus to new and yet more wonderful destinations. The second thing about this journey is that we don't undertake it alone. We travel the road in a complex web of relationships with people we love, with friends, with family, in the family of the church, and in every encounter with another person, a shop assistant, someone we speak to at a call centre, a doctor or nurse, someone working on the train or the bus. In every encounter, there is an opportunity to see Christ in that person and to be Christ for that person. In every encounter is the possibility that our journey may be enriched and or that we may enrich someone else's journey. So to be at peace with ourselves and God is also to be at peace with others. And thirdly, it's a journey through an environment with things to see, things to wonder at, things to enjoy. William Henry Davis's poem, Leisure, isn't uh, for me the greatest poem ever written, but it does make a very good point. What is this life if full of care we have no time to stand and stare? This year, my son gave me an inspired birthday present, a safari walk on the net estate near Horsham. In the 1990s, its owners abandoned unprofitable farming and allowed nature to take over with the help of a few introduced species like white, white storks and native breeds of pigs, deer and cattle, roaming free and living as nature intended. We were led by a knowledgeable and enthusiastic guide who pointed out the butterflies, birds and plants flourishing in the rewilded land in the absence of human interference. And on our walk we stopped frequently to take in the sights and sounds of nature around us, and that, after all, was what we were there for. But perhaps we need to take more time every day to stand and stare, to pause on our journey and tune in to what is around us in the natural world. To be at peace with ourselves, with Jesus, with God, is also to seek peace with all creation, to find God's presence there from the smallest insect to the biggest tree in all its beauty and miraculous complexity. So this is the journey for which we need to pack. And the question Jesus asks us in today's Gospel is what do we really need for this journey? What is it that is really essential in life? What can we really not do without? 
The first Christian expected Jesus to return literally at any moment to establish once and for all God's kingdom of justice and peace, in which, as Revelation promises, death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. Under those circumstances, possessions were simply irrelevant and might as well be got rid of. In Acts, we read how in the beginnings of the church, no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. But time went by, and as we read through the New Testament, we can see the church gradually adjusting to the idea that Jesus' return might not get quite a long way off. The church, in fact, begins to rely on people with large houses to provide clandestine places in which to celebrate the Eucharist. And on those with available cash to contribute to, for example, Paul's collection to support Christians in Jerusalem. Were I to suggest that we really must dispose of all our resources and give them to the poor, uh, Alistair, our wonderful treasurer, would run screaming to the door, closely followed by Father Michael, I suspect. So giving to the church and giving to the poor are not alternatives. To give to both according to our means is a vital part of our stewardship of the gifts we've received from our generous God. So it might sound as though I explained away Jesus' words about selling possessions as a saying we can conveniently park and forget about. But we shouldn't. This is a saying about priorities. It challenges us to think about what in life is truly important. There's a wise saying about wealth that you can't take it with you. We heard in last week's gospel about the man who built new barns in which to store a good harvest, thinking to himself that it would enable him to live a comfortable life for many years ahead, only for God to say to him, you fool, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. So this is not to, to deny that though I can't live by bread alone and do need bread, it is to view the possessions, the stuff, with which I surround myself, or think I might like to surround myself, in a different way. I ought indeed to view all the things I possess in the light of millions of people in the world, and many indeed in this country, who lack even basic necessities. I ought to think also about what is really necessary in my life, not only my own existence, but the very existence of our species. But there's another dimension to this. The human race is also on a journey and it's heading blindly into very dangerous territory. I'm referring, of course, to the climate emergency, which is much on our minds during the searingly hot days we've been having. Governments are constantly pursuing the goal of growth. The economy is growing is the slogan that all is right with the world. But, of course, it isn't. Buying more stuff, creating demand for more stuff, creating the illusion that it's fine for us to have, eat, wear, and just possess what we want, when we want it, to be able to go where we want and how quickly we want, may look good from one perspective, but in fact, there is a cost, an enormous cost. <coughs> so far, so far, it's not primarily we in the UK who are paying it. It's people on low-lying islands in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, in the coastal areas of Bangladesh. It's people in the drought-stricken parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And there are droughts too in the United States and France and Spain. And it's people whose homes have been destroyed by wildfire fires in the US and Australia. And recently some homes have been destroyed by fires even here in East London. The cost of cheap clothing is borne by people in the sweatshops of Asia. The cost of cheap food is animals suffering in factory farms and those affected by the pollution they produce. It's the devastating effect of soil impoverishment and the impact on bees and other vital pollinators of excessive use of insecticides. 
So if the human race is to survive in any quality of life, or indeed survive at all, it needs to decide what is really important. And that starts with me. Starts with me. Starts with all of us as individuals deciding what is really important to us. And as Jesus reminds us in today's Gospel, I can't know when or how suddenly my journey will end, when the Master will come for me. So what am I carrying in my suitcase? Many of us carry so much more than we need, and many of us are weighed down by burdens without even being aware of it. What passes for riches in this world are of no use to us when we are gone. But our relationship with God, our relationship with God in prayer and worship and in the fabric of daily life, that never ends because, as St. Paul says, love never ends. And it is that which is the unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. In faith, hope, and love, let us praise the Lord. Gracious God, we pray for your church worldwide, for the Queen, for all who minister to us in the service of Christ. May those who confess your name be united in your truth, live together in your love, 
and reveal your glory to the world. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray for our world. Give wisdom to all in authority and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace that we may honour one another and seek the common good. We pray for hope and endurance to reign in Ukraine, Afghanistan, Yemen and other nations where there is war, poverty and injustice. We pray for those facing economic hardship, desperate to know how they will survive. And we give thanks for the safe passage of the ship exporting grain from Ukraine and pray this will continue. Creator God, you have created such amazing life on our planet and yet we are destroying it. We pray that you will raise up global leaders with wisdom and power to save our precious planet. May we too be alert to the impact we have on our environment and act wisely. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray for the life of St. John's, for Lynn and Mike, our church wardens, for PCC members, and all who willingly give of their time. We give thanks for the ongoing activities during August, including the Bereavement Cafe, Tea and Chat, the Sunday Lunch Club, reading and knitting groups, and open church on Saturdays. Give grace to us, our families and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Bring comfort to those who are lonely or anxious, those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. And we pray for Marjorie, Nicola, Dory, Joanna, Tony, Aonia, Janet, Hilary, Rosemary, Alice, Cam, Jan, Andrew, Ralph, and anyone personally known to us. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your presence. We commemorate those who have died recently. Dave Moore, Stephen Hall, Joe Campbell, Phyllis Fraser, and Archie Battersby. We, pay for that, we pray for family and friends as they support one another in their time of grief. And in our years of mind, we remember Fred Ramsey, Carmen Perez Powers, Maureen Carville, Andy Law, Bass Marshall, and Stanley Cairn. May we be assured that they are secure in your unconditional, never-ending life. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful Father, accept our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for the peace. Christ has gathered into his kingdom of justice and peace, people of every race, language, and nation. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us share a sign of peace.
Lord is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All is from you. Father, 
we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gift that you have given us, this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we praise you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us, and upon these gifts, sanctifying them, and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one in body and spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember all the bishops gathered at Lambda and all who minister in your church. Remember all your people and those who seek your truth. Remember all who strive for justice and peace. Remember all who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Bring them into the place of eternal joy and love. And grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, John the Baptist, the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave to you, 
and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thy spirit.
strengthen for service, Lord, the hands that have taken holy things. May the ears which have heard your word be deaf to clamor and to speak. May the tongues which have sung your praise be free from deceit. May the eyes which have seen the tokens of your love shine with the light of hope. And may the bodies which have been fed with your body be refreshed with the fullness of your life. Glory to you forever. Amen. We pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your heart, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Notice is today, just to remind everyone that, um, oh, hang on a second. September the 4th is the last Sunday before the start of the new school year. I know those of you who go to school don't like to hear that, but it is coming. So, uh, September the 4th on Sunday, 9.45, if you bring your rucksack with your school supplies, there will be a blessing on your rucksack. That, coupled with a lot of hard work and paying attention and doing homework, you'll get good grades, guaranteed. <laughs> so put that in your diary and we'll get the kids started to a good start for the academic year. Also, I'd like to say a great big thank you to Marie for providing us with music this morning. Um, we've been able to sing all bits and pieces because we get to sing. Thank you, Marie. Thanks. did not do today's service in a southern accent, which I would normally have done. <laughs> right. Shall we stand for God's blessing? <coughs> the peace of God which passes all in sight. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you 